Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. Karen, what is this piece of art doing here? So my good friend Jessica Rollins makes these fancy pieces of art uh, at her hackerspace i3 Detroit. Um, she laser cuts and etches them and then her kind of special touch is painting them. And she was selling this at PenguinCon last spring and I loved it so much I had to buy it. And it's extra cool because she added a little LED pack. Oh! So it lights up. Uh, the problem with it is if I put this art on my wall, then if I want it to light up, I have to physically go and turn the little battery switch manually on. Yeah, I have to do it manually. So, and then, you know, if I forget to turn it off and the battery will die, I have to constantly replace the batteries. So I was hoping you might be able to help me with a solution. So in this episode, I'm going to help Karen wire up a solution for her light-activated wall art. And we'll also use this as an opportunity to talk about the differences between passive and active components. Let's get arted. I mean started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay. First, we're gonna talk about passive components, what they are, what are some common types of passive components and what they're used for. Then we're gonna talk about active components, how they differentiate from passive components, and then some examples of them. We'll also talk about how passives and actives work together. Then we're going to wire up a breadboard circuit test of something that Karen has been wanting to build for a while. Once we know that the circuit test works, we are then going to transfer it into the art project itself that Karen wants to electrify, and then I'll guide Karen through the project so you can learn through her. Let's talk about the difference between passive and active components in a circuit. Okay, passive components are things that cannot control the flow of electrons. They include, but are not limited to, resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Inductors are kind of like capacitors. They can help maintain a steady voltage, you know, so if your voltage is going brrrr, these use a magnetic field to maintain it, whereas a capacitor uses an electric field to maintain it. So they can help the circuit, but they can't actually turn things on or off or create digital logic or amplification. Active components are things that can control the flow of electrons in a circuit. Examples include diodes. Actually, sometimes these are considered passives, but I would consider them to be active because, you know, it can go in one direction but not the other. So, you know, it seems like it's kind of got a decision making going on there. And of course, transistors, the building block of all modern electronics. This is electricity controlling electricity. They used to do that with big clunky electromechanical relays. Now it's done with circuitry. So it's because of that transistor that I'm able to talk into this camera today. So this is a voltage regulator. So this is an integrated circuit. It's made up of other things. So basically any integrated circuit is also going to be an active component. You may come across things like a uh, array of resistors. It might kind of look like an integrated circuit, but not be one, but anything integrated is going to be an active component. And then finally, I mean, this one's kind of obvious, but microcontrollers are active because they certainly do control electricity. So in the past, things would be made out of mostly passive components. And then in the 20s and 30s, they had vacuum tubes. And those were actually active electronics back in the day. You know, the vacuum tube was the predecessor to the transistor. Once the transistor had been invented, and more importantly, once it started appearing in consumer electronics in the 1960s, you would see like something with a radio, it would still be mostly passives. Most of the circuit was analog, but there would be a few transistors in there to provide the amplification, making it an electronic circuit, or in that case, a transistor radio. As a year have gone by, we need less passives to perform the same things because we can fit more of the logic into integrated circuits. So if you look at a radio now, it's mostly just integrated circuits and very few passives. However, passives are still important. As we talked about with the capacitors and inductors, they're important for keeping a smooth power flow and making sure the voltage stays steady because as our voltages get lower and lower, we have to make sure that they're even more steady. Otherwise, you know, they'll change and affect the logic. So passives and actives still work together today and that is the main difference between them. All right, Karen, let's take apart your art. Yeah, let's do pliers so that we don't accidentally damage the wood. Well, this one's not, look at that, that's not even in place, so. Well, you were worried about nothing. Pull it down. 
Mm. Hey, you know what? They made two pairs of pliers last year. I know, I'll be I was back. Say. Saying aluminium is technically correct. Just depends. Yeah, but on I think lever and lever are both like American. They just. Well, what about potatoes and potatoes? I've never heard it called a potato though. Yeah, I don't really know anyone that says potato other than in that song. Or soda versus pop. You know, I used to say pop all the time because I'm from Michigan, and I had a friend from whoa sparkly. I had a friend from Oklahoma that said soda all the time, so now I say soda. All right, so how was this done? Mm. Are those surface mount LEDs. Those are those are quick surface mount LEDs. Let me get a magnifying glass. So this looks like some kind of enamel wire, and she surface mounted it to the LEDs. Well, I mean, I guess there's no reason to tear it up since it works. Yeah. Okay. So we really just need to tear down at the battery pack. Pretty much. Yeah. So. All right. So these are three volt batteries, which means we need to put six volts into it, but five volts would probably be close enough. Okay. So I think for the next test, we should just remove this. And we'll give it enough lead so we can always attach it if we have to. Mm -hmm. So let's pull it apart. Hey, question. You know what, I should let you do that. So with LEDs, you usually want to put a resistor in line, right? Yes. So when you do packs like this where you've got, like this one's got six volts, but I've seen some that run off of three volts. Do they normally have like a resistor in the battery pack or is it because there's enough LEDs that's not a problem? Like how, is, how does that all work? Usually at lower voltages, you can just apply three volts like, and it's fine. Like you ever see okay. like where they take, they put the LED around a battery and then they yeah. stick it on things with a magnet. Yeah. That's usually fine. It's usually when you have like a higher voltage, like five volts and up that's trying a resistor. Okay. But it's a good question. If you add a resistor, does it extend the life of the LED at all? Um, well, if battery? you don't have the proper resistor and you overpower the LED, then it can, yeah, it can degrade the LED. Okay. So yeah, in most cases you do run a resistor, but I think if we put, well, we should try this with five volts, it should pretty much look the same. Okay. So if that's less voltage, it should be less of a problem. But we could also take a look and see if there's anything inside of there, but I, I think it's just a switch. Because cool. if you had if you had resistors on this, you'd have one on every LED, mm -hmm. not just one main resistor. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the resistors are in parallel. See how they go between the wires? Mm -hmm. So they're all getting the same amount of voltage. If you put them in series, then you'd have to actually increase the voltage because it would would go, go down as you go across right. them, yeah. Now that we've set up what we're going to do, it's time to breadboard a prototype of it. Okay, let's do this. All right, so far we have the pull down resistor, we have the load connected to the transistor, and then we're gonna attach some external power wires here to go to the power supply. If we look at the voltage at the base, we see that it is zero because this resistor is pulling it down. Mm -hmm. When you're doing things with logic, you can't just set something high or low. You have to have current limiting resistors. Mm -hmm. Because if you attached a high signal to this and there wasn't a resistor here, you'd be basically shorting out positive voltage and negative voltage, and that would be bad. Right. That's why you have current limiting resistors. Okay. So this is an example of a passive helping an active component. Yay, passives! Okay, so attach one lead of the photocell to the positive voltage rail. Okay. A little closer to the resistor, though. There you go. Okay, mm -hmm. now the other end goes to the leftmost pin, which is the base. So bright. Ah! Yeah. So bright. All the base is going to see is the high voltage. There's no chance for it to go low. So we have to give it the ability to go low as well. Mm -hmm. So here is a potentiometer. Yay. Okay, so the center tap of the potentiometer, put that in the same pin as the base on the transistor, and then you can put the other ones on the other side of the breadboard. All right, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach the other side of this. So we grab another dark jumper, like green or something, and attach one of the leads. Yep, attach that to ground as well. All right, so this should give us some control. So we're making what's called a voltage divider, where there's a resistor on either side, and the amount of resistance on the other side, high or low, causes the voltage between them to change. Okay. Does that make sense? The trick is you want to adjust the photo cell until the light turns off. There we go. I'll go turn off the lights, ready? Okay. With the lights out, this is dangerous. Does that seem to do what you want? I think so. That's the idea, right? It turns off yeah. when the lights do? See, let's do one more thing. Let's actually add an inline resistor here. So see how we had those connected directly to the base? Right. Um, move them over here a little bit. We're just changing what's hooked up to the base. So yeah, attach that resistor oh, to the oops. base. I thought that was hooked up to the base. You have to become the ace of base, Karen. Can now attach this potentiometer to that same spot. So you're going to have three things there. You might want to move the photo yeah, cell up a, up a notch. This is why you breadboard. It's, it's always good to test it ahead of time. Moving stuff around. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's yeah, try it now. Like. Yeah. I like that. So there's like only a little bit of light in the room. Mm-hmm. It's slightly lit. Look, I can look at it safely. <sighs> Where's the map to Skywalker? Okay, so we should try this now with your BB-8. Okay.
Okay, so the wall wart is five volts, right. right? But we realized five volts is too high to use with these LEDs as they're wired. Correct. And you won't let me rewire them despite all my crying. Well, you can rewire them all you want as long as you continue using these LEDs. Mm, then might as well not rewire them. Exactly. Okay, so we know these LEDs work well with 3.3 volts along with a potentiometer so we can limit the current. Mm -hmm. So we need to take this five volt circuit since we don't have a 3.3 volt wall wart, we have mm -hmm. a five volt wall wart, so we have to knock the power down. Okay. So that's why I want to use a regulator. I mean, there. I think the Nintendo DS had a 3.3 volt wall wart, but those are too rare. Well, no. they're not rare, but we don't have one. So that other transistor that was laying there? Yeah. That's a PNP, so why don't you set the 102 aside and grab the tip 107. This one basically is the opposite of the other one. So this works when you have a, a zero or a low voltage on the base. Okay. So you actually hook it up a little differently. The pins are the same, base, collector, emitter, but in this case, the emitter takes in the positive voltage and then the collector sources it to something else. Okay. So your positive voltage would go on the right, and yeah, use a colored wire, please. No, I'm sorry, use a lighter colored wire. Yes, yeah, so like yellow or orange. Sorry, this is my anal retentive thing. Well, if you had red and black, I'd be using red and black. That's what's throwing me. Doing my best! Connect ground to this guy. I was gonna say, this yeah. one needs ground. The output, the voltage, is going to come from the collector, which is the center pin. So connect the center pin of the tip 107 to the voltage input of the regulator, which is the rightmost pin on the regulator. Hook up the sense pin to the regulator. And that's what would be going to our LEDs, right? Uh, but right now yes, but right now we're it. just testing it. So we still need to control the base of this. So let's attach the base with a 10K resistor to positive voltage. That will turn the PNP, Darlington Transistor Array, off. Because the other thing we want, we want this thing to consume as little power as possible when it's not active. Right. Okay, shall we try it again? Okay, zero volts, which is kind of what we want, I guess. So how a voltage divider works, excuse me. Let's say we have that, and then we have that. So let's say this goes to ground, and that goes to VCC, and this goes to the base. Let's say this is 10K, which it is right now. If this is lower than that, if this is like 1K, mm -hmm. that means there's going to be less resistance here, which means the current's gonna be pulled low. So what we can do is we can grab a 1K resistor, or a wire with a 1K, and that should allow us to basically switch on and off the PNP transistor, and that should turn on our power supply. So stick one end of that into the ground, connection there and then stick the other one like somewhere here great now attach a wire to that same row that you attach the 1k resistor to super now if you touch that to this it should activate the transistor once there's power all right let's try that again okay there's nothing okay so go ahead and touch that wire there to that resistor yep there's your voltage yeah 3.3 so something else we can do with this meter here is we can switch it to amps. So it shows us how much power is being drawn. So why don't we do this? Why don't we switch to the wall wart now? All right, activate the transistor. Activate. Cool. So what we'll do, Karen, is instead of using this wire, we'll use the photoresistor to provide a path to ground. Okay. So instead of, this make, basically makes a direct connection. Mm -hmm. The photo cell will as well. Once light saturates it, it'll have a low resistance. Right. It'll have a lower resistance than this 10K resistor, which means the transistor will activate. Okay, so I will hook up the photoresistor there to where the yep. resistor's going. Just stick that over there so that these are in line. In theory, that should work. We might okay. need to do a little bit more checking than that. Okay, 3.3. Hmm. Yeah, not quite as low as I'd like. That's okay. We'll, we'll adjust it. So here's what we'll do. We'll t remove this like this, and we'll set it over here and actually get a, a reading from it. So we can like use the maths. So the saturated light voltage is 475 ohms. Now put your hand over it. Put your hand in the air like you don't care. Uh -oh. Actually, okay. we should turn off the lights to get a proper reading. Okay, 180K. Wow, that's a lot. Not quite as bright as the lights, but it's in the same ballpark. So attach the photoresistor to the base of the transistor and then just put the other lead over there. But leave a space at the bottom here so we can attach a potentiometer. This 10K resistor, once you remove that and put it back in the bucket, we can replace that with a potentiometer. Cool. Now connect the other lead of this to ground. Well done. I am proud of you. Because I grabbed the color that yep. you like. I know I don't have the right color, but it's closer, you know. All right. So what I want to do now is that resistor that was pulling it up, mm -hmm. the 10K, I want to use a potentiometer for that. That way we can adjust it just like we were before. Okay. Um, um, let's check the value of that. This one here, that's the wiper. That's mm -hmm. what's going across the pots. If you want to know the full value of it, you test it on the ends. Oh, this thing is low on batteries. That's about a 10K. Um, yeah, that should probably work. So put the wiper or the center one, stick that in right under there so it connects to the base, and then attach one of its leads to positive voltage. Cool. 
So now we have a voltage divider. So what we can do here, let's test the output of the voltage regulator. All right, try it now. So that's sort of low. And it goes back up to the three, R3.3, essentially. So let's hook this up to this before we blow that LED. So this, with the light saturating this, this should turn on. It's not going to be as bright because it's less voltage. Right. OK, so That's try covering it up. Cool. All right, let me try. See what if I... All right, time for BB-8s. All right, tell you what, I'll let you plug in the power. So if it dies, it's your fault. Back off, man. Hey! Sweet. Ta -da. Uh -uh. Want me to turn off the lights? Do you have a flashlight you could hit it with? Yeah. Ready? Huh? It was then time to wire up the project. Karen got to work recreating our circuit on a piece of protoboard that we then mounted inside of the art. Next, I designed and 3D printed a mount for the photo cell so that it will directly receive light at the top and also match the wood. The last step was a laser cut a piece for the back of the painting so it could be easily mounted to the wall. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I'm really happy with it. I'm excited that we were able to modify my art so that it can only use as much power as necessary. So when you Yay. go into your craft dungeon, it can be like, oh, automatic. Yeah. Have you ever incorporated electronics into a piece of art? Tell us how in the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Beep boop. Beep boop. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did Poe Dameron's jacket stay inside the TIE fighter if he was thrown hundreds of feet away? Movie magic. Was it like, maybe it was really hot, and so it was like stuck to the seat, you know? Like vinyl? But it was like outside of it. Did, so... did he reach in and pull it out of it? Karen, he's doing the camera slightly different from Max. I'm freaking out. What are you doing? Oh. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.